Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and tonight I want to take you through uh, some methods for spotting tactics in your games. Now, why is this so important uh, in your chess games? Well, uh, I think a lot of players at pretty much every level uh, are generally able to solve tactics puzzles at a level uh, a little bit above their rating. Now, there's uh, some exceptions. Some people just can't do tactics puzzles. They're just not good at them. Um, but for the most part, everybody, uh, whatever rating level you're at, you tend to be able to solve tactics puzzles that are a little bit uh, uh, above your rating. And why is that? Well, it's because it's only really half of the process to playing a tactic in a game. When you do a tactics puzzle, you actually have a huge advantage over uh, when tactics are appearing in your games. And that is, you know that it's a puzzle. You know that there's a correct move to find, and you know that you should be thinking uh, about finding a tactic. So this class tonight is about bridging that other, uh, other half of the process, uh, knowing when you should be looking for a tactic, knowing when you can spot one, and uh, where they're lurking in your games. So to do this, I want to go over uh, a bunch of rapid games that I played recently, and maybe we'll go over a rapid game at a little bit of a higher level as well, uh, with some really interesting games being played at the Magnus Carlsen Invitational uh, this year. But to start with, let's jump into this game that I played on Lee Chess. Uh, my username is the Llama Lord. My opponent is d4, knight f6, bishop g5, 1 hyphen 0. So, uh, true to the username, my opponent did in fact play d4, knight f6, bishop g5, but then not true to the username, it was not 1 0. So the game continued, surprisingly. I thought I would have had to resign after white's second move, but turns out Lee Chess did let me play another move, so I played d5. And so far we have a, a pretty calm opening. Nothing too much goes on. I play c5, attacking the center. Uh, white goes for a more conservative kind of setup, almost like a London system, except the bishop is here on g5. See bishop d3, castles, and now f4. Uh, and I'm sort of blowing past this because it's not the main point of the class, but I played b6, knight gf3, and the point of my opening uh, was delaying the development of this b8 knight so that I can trade off white's good bishop here on d3. So these pieces get traded and white castles. And so, so far, so good. Uh, no real tactics to be had in this game. But if you're the player with the white pieces, there is already something you should sort of be taking note of if you are actively looking for tactics in your games. So I'm interested to see what the chat room has to say here. It's a very vague question, but I think someone might be able to come up with an answer. If you're playing with the white pieces, what has black done that you should take note of and keep track of for later in the game so far. All right, I think people are still filtering in, so I'm just gonna give it away. It's this knight on a6, and this is the core of what I wanna talk about tonight. Uh, generally, there are a few things you need to look for in your games to know when a tactic might arise. And this is sort of the first thing. Uh, it's loose pieces. So this knight on a6 is a loose piece. What does that mean? Well, it means that the knight is either not defended well enough or not defended at all. Now, for the moment, the knight isn't attacked, so it's not just a hanging piece, but it is loose. And what happens is, if you have one or more loose pieces, sometimes the moves that can attack your loose pieces will be able to win material. And this is a, a great way to find tactics, both in tactics puzzles, when you already know that there's a tactic, but also in your games, it's even more helpful. Because if you start realizing, hey, my opponent has a lot of pieces that are under-defended or not defended at all, uh, maybe I have some way to attack them. So, so far, this net on a6 is really the only loose piece, so no major tactics yet, but still something important to keep an eye on. Um, I actually played the move b5 in the game here, trying to expand on the queen side. My opponent played knight e5, uh, challenging some light squares. I played queen c7. My opponent played queen f3 and started launching a kingside attack. And I continue out now with b4. Uh, my opponent plays kind of a strange king h1. Uh, we get take take, rook a b8. Uh, and now g4. So, this brings me. Uh, actually, surprisingly, kind of already 
to the next thing I want to talk about here. It seems as if that uh, white hasn't done too much wrong, but the position is already sort of ripe for tactics. So I'm interested if the chat room can find a good move for black here that might already lead to an advantage. What do we think? A good move for black. It's not really a trick question. Sort of the most intuitive move is correct here. But there's a kind of a deep, deep reason for it. Kind of a deeper reason. So black to move here. What do we think? Mm. Yeah, so Tim has the right idea. You just go rook b2. And this doesn't look like much of a tactic yet, but notably, it is attacking the loose piece in white's position. And this is something that you definitely want to keep track of here. Notably, all the tactics are going to revolve around pieces that are sort of vulnerable to attack in some way. Now, that might sort of seem like you know, redundant. Like, of course, the tactics are going to involve the pieces that you can attack. But really notably, uh, it all starts with attacking a knight which just has no defenders. And that's where all these tactics are going to start arising. My opponent plays rook f2 to defend the knight. But at this point, thanks to the tempo I gained on this knight, the knight is actually still loose here. And there's actually a few other loose pieces in the position uh, that are sort of loose by a different definition than, than what I first gave. So yes, this knight is loose because it's underdefended. It's attacked once and only defended once. That means if I attack it just one more time, uh, it will be a threat my opponent has to respond to. But there are other ways to sort of make these tempo threats and attack quote unquote loose pieces. So I'm also going to claim that this rook on f2 is loose here. Now why is that? It does seem to be well defended. It's defended once and attacked zero times. But because it's a piece worth five points and other pieces on the chessboard are worth less than that, uh, it is still sort of susceptible to getting attacked. If this rook is attacked by, for example, a knight, it's going to be a threat that white has to respond to. And Thirdly, in the position, there is another uh, sort of reason why the position is ripe for a tactic here. And this is the third thing I want to talk about. I, I wanted to do this game first because it sort of has everything uh, I want to talk about. Uh, a piece that is just loose, a piece that is vulnerable to attack by a piece of lesser value, and a, a, a couple pieces set up for a common tactical motif. So we have all these things bouncing around in the position. And for those reasons, there is a winning quote unquote move here that does allow black to get some advantage. So black to move in the position. Anthony has a great idea in the move knight e4. If there is going to be a tactical win here, knight e4 is likely it. Um, I actually played c takes d4 first in the game, which doesn't actually spoil anything because if my opponent tries to trade off first, I'm just sort of careening through the position and winning. But c takes d4 first, my opponent plays c takes d4, and then as advertised, knight e4 comes into the, comes into the position. Now, what did uh, trading first really get me? Well, my queen has a little bit better access into the game now. But of course, the line doesn't end. So white to move and try to survive here. Uh, white can actually do a pretty good job of not just losing outright. <clears throat> and I should mention, I highlighted these two pieces for pieces that are vulnerable to a common tactical motif. And of course, that motif is the idea of f6. This is the point of knight e4 here. With knight e4, I uh, make a threat to the knight. I make a threat to the slightly loose piece on f2. And I also threatened to play uh, f6, forking these two pieces. And that is how tactics can arise. Uh, my, opponent, my opponent did find a good response, though, in knight takes e4. This is really the only move. If you try to play something like bishop takes e7, you can take this rook with check and take the bishop and be up in exchange. Uh, and if you just defend. Well, I, I guess there's really no other move to defend because the rook is just going to be hanging regardless. So knight takes e4 only move, d takes e4, and my opponent plays queen to g3. And now here I actually had an improvement in the game that I did not find. 
Uh, I simply took the rook on f2, satisfied in my tactic with queen takes f2 and f6, but my opponent actually finds a pretty nice intermezzo here. Uh, Sebastian says bishop e7, knight d2, queen e2 attacks the knight. So that's why um, after bishop e7 in this line, we're not taking the knight. We're just taking the rook with check and then taking here. So yeah, of course, bishop takes e7 is the nice move that my opponent found in the game. Now, what's the point of this? Well, the point is I also had a few loose and vulnerable pieces in my own territory. And so my opponent is sort of launching counter tactics here. Uh, this bishop was a bit loose, only defended once. Of course, this rook is literally hanging in the position. And this rook on f8 is also sort of vulnerable to attack. And there's actually no real way out of this one for me here. Uh, I can play a move like rook takes h2 and go up a pawn. In the game, I actually just played rook c2. And the game continued from here after bishop f8, king f8. Now, uh, with these tactics, black didn't actually win any material, but black still does have a good position here uh, because of the control over the c file and the openness around, uh, around this white king. Now, I went on to win this game, but that's not super relevant. This is the really relevant part of the game that I want to talk about here, starting with rook b2. So rook b2, rook f2. I think it would be really easy for a lot of people to instantly play a move like rook b8 here. Just like rook fb8, say, yeah, my position looks pretty good. I'm just going to keep invading. Maybe I'll take here and try to invade on the b file as well. But uh, really importantly, this is a position right for tactics. And the alarm bells that should be going off are sort of realizing, hey, all these pieces are sort of loose to a, a 94 idea. And these pieces are sort of vulnerable to a common tactical motif. So way as far back as here, you can be imagining, hey, if I ever move my knight with tempo, I'm going to get this move f6, and I'll be able to win a piece. Now, it doesn't work immediately, but we'll see this idea come into play, of course, right here. And so that's what spotting tactics in your games is all about. It's about being aware of pieces that are vulnerable to tactics. Even if the tactic doesn't work immediately, when the pieces kind of find the right combination of, uh, of things to do, then that's when your tactics appear. So that was my first example that I wanted to go over. And my tactic didn't even work in this game. The point, though, is, is that I spotted a position that was ripe for tactics. And that is what we are trying to train. Uh, now, in this position, after queen h4, uh, black is all actually already winning again with the move f6 because the knight is in a trap. But I actually missed this one. So just to show you nobody's perfect, my tactic didn't even work, and then I missed the winning tactic. Did go on to win the game, though. So questions on this introductory tactic here uh, with rook b2. Can you take h2? So yeah, rook takes h2 would have been winning a pawn there. Uh, exquisite corpse with um, just an extra pawn. But uh, uh, honestly, I prefer the other line because now I am not uh, in, in control of the C file. I thought that was a bit more relevant, and that's why I played rook C2. Uh, OK. Let us move along to our next example, then. It's going to be yet another rapid game for me. And the reason why I am showing you guys a lot of rapid games because so I think this is the absolute best way uh, to sort of train your intuition for these kinds of tactics. Because when you play a really long time control game over the board, you can sort of just brute force it by like trying to calculate out to find a tactic on every turn. But what's going to end up happening is you're going to spend a lot of time trying to find tactics in positions where there just aren't any. And you're, you're going to run out of time pretty quickly. You're also going to run out of energy pretty quickly. So it's important to develop this sort of intuition for when a tactic might appear in the position. So let's sort of flip through this game and see if we can spot any potential tactics along the way. In this one, I started with d4. We get a queen's gambit, exchange variation, bishop g5, c6, e3, uh, bishop out to f5 now, and queen f3. And we play this sort of funny line. Uh, knight ge2, knight a6, knight g3, 
And potential tactics in the position chat room. What do you think? Are there already some potential ideas to be aware of? So far, I would argue there aren't really any loose pieces, but there are uh, a couple really important common tactical motifs that we should be keeping in mind. Some really important tactical motifs that we should already be ke keeping in mind. All right, Carnificina says they see nothing. And that's because there's no tactic in the position. But there are tactical motifs that you need to be aware of. That's the point I'm trying to get across here. You don't need to calculate out to find a tactic, but you do need to be aware of sort of potential threats, potential tactics. And that's what we have here. There's actually one for each side. With the white pieces, I need to be at least a little bit wary of this move knight b4 because it threatens to jump in with knight c2 and a very common tactical motif, forking the king and the rook with the, the typical knight fork. And now as the player with the black pieces, I actually need to be a little bit worried about this bishop. Why is that? Well, whenever you see a bishop stuck in front of its own pawns like this, it's going to be a little bit vulnerable to getting trapped. So moves like h4, h5 could be a potential threat for white. Even f4, f5 could be a potential threat for white. Now, I don't know if these are going to be relevant in the position yet. I don't know if I can use any of these tactical ideas to win the game. But I'm keeping them in mind. Right? you got to keep these in mind and say, hey, wait a second. Can I combine one of these ideas with something else? Maybe not yet, but in the future. My opponent actually plays knight b4 directly, which is, of course, just a wrong move. Um, it makes the threat of a tactic, but uh, one move threats can sort of be parried here, and king d2 is just a good move for white. So it's important to understand, when I'm saying be aware of this tactic, that this tactical idea exists, I don't mean you should go for this tactic. You should like try to make this tactic happen right away. Very often that's wrong. But for example, if I were to play some sort of bad move here, and I'm trying to figure out how I can even make knight b4 be a relevant tactic, maybe I can't. But uh, if knight b4 could somehow make a secondary threat at the same time, then I could run into some danger. That's the idea. OK, so knight b4, king d2 played in the game. My opponent plays a5 now. And in a sense, used this, tact used this tactical threat uh, to gain a tempo to play the move a5. Uh, now in the game, uh, I actually make the same mistake as my opponent. And I play the move f4, uh, kind of just making a one move threat. Uh, my opponent plays h5, of course, to give the bishop this square. I play h4 to cement this pawn onto the h5 square. My opponent plays bishop d6. And I want to pause again and see if you guys can spot any potential ideas in this position. Already here, there are some things you should be wary of once again. So what should you be aware of in this position? Are there potential tactics? Are there potential tactics here, chat room? And yeah, Amos actually already has a great tactic. So with the white pieces here, we actually have a number of loose or undefended pieces. Uh, this knight on g3 is sort of it, it is undefended. It's not attacked, so it's a loose piece. And believe it or not, we can actually consider uh, sort of these pawns to be loose pieces as well. This pawn on f4 is only defended once, and it is in fact attacked once. So if something happens to this e3 pawn, then uh, we're going to be in trouble. And in fact, here I played the move a3. And this just turns out to be a blunder. Black does have a winning tactic, and it's the tactic that uh, Amos pointed out here. Knight c2, taking, taking advantage of a common tactical motif, attacking my loose rook on a1. And then after the rook moves, we're going to get knight takes d4, bishop takes f4, and it's going to be a rough time uh, with the white pieces here. The knight is simply hanging on g3, and we have another common tactical motif. So that's where these tactics are coming from. It's really important to realize that uh, whenever you make loose pieces like this, you know the, the age-old saying, loose pieces drop off, does have some basis in reality. 
And after bishop d6, a3, my opponent actually didn't find the move knight c2. And this is what I mean when I say uh, players can solve tactics puzzles well above their rating level, but when they find when it actually happens in a real game, very often they just get missed. If you gave this position to my opponent uh, and said black to move and win, without a doubt, I'm quite confident they would be able to find knight c2, and knight takes d4, bishop takes f4. But if you give this position to my opponent in a game and play a3, very often knight a6 gets played without thinking, and that's what happens here. And now neither player realizes how dangerous white's position actually was, and the game just continues. So again, the point I'm trying to get across here, in your games, you should be looking for tactics revolving around the loose pieces. You don't need to be hardcore calculating on every turn, but when these common motifs and loose pieces start to add up, we have something like four pieces vulnerable to attack in white's position, that's when, the tactic, that's when the tactics start to arise and when they could have arisen for my opponent here. Now we're going to fast forward a little bit. Uh, I played bishop d3, just getting developed, knight e2, um, and slowly but surely started to actually defend my pieces. Uh, I think I get outplayed a little bit though. My opponent uh, captures a pawn for free. This though isn't really a tactic, just sort of a blunder by white. It's a rapid game, it happens. Uh, this knight on g3 also ends up falling. But at the end of the day, uh, I find some activity. None of this is super important. We're getting to the important parts. And now I want to talk about uh, another type of threat that we actually haven't touched on yet. So we're going to look at a, a wide variety of ways tactics can arise and a wide variety of things you, you want to look out for. So white to move here in this position, I play the move h5. And this is not a tactic. Of course, this isn't a tactic. This is just pus pushing uh, a pawn in the end game, right? Past pawns must be pushed. But the advanced pawn is actually another uh, tactical idea that you need to be aware of. So we have these common tactical motifs, these forks, these pins, uh, double attacks, things of that nature. We have this idea of attacking loose pieces, and now the idea of an advanced pawn is actually another way to threaten to win material. Rather than capture material, you just threaten to make another queen and win material that way. So by playing h5, already uh, you, should start be, you should start thinking about tactics with both sides here. Uh, with black, you need to be thinking, all right, do I have some way to stop this pawn? Can my opponent do some funny threat with the rook and then queen? Do I need to be worried about this? You know, and, and, and this is when you should start calculating. And with white, of course, you're just doing the exact same thing, but in reverse. You're, you're thinking, what, what can I do with this rook? How do I get this pawn promoted? And can I use this pawn to deliver any tactics. Now in the game, my opponent plays the move f5, trying to bring the king over to stop the pawn. But already, uh, white to move and win. There is a tactic in the position. White to move here. Who sees it? A tool says rook h6. OK. What's the idea? What's the idea of rook h6? Rook e8 and h6, that's another one. OK. So you guys are along the right track. And this is where actually being able to solve tactics puzzles does come in, come in handy. Of course, that's another useful skill that you want to train. But the point I'm trying to get across is this is a position where you should be thinking about tactics. Uh, now in the game, I was thinking about tactics, but I actually missed the correct move here, as is most of the chat here. So rook h6 doesn't actually do a whole lot for you here, I think. Um, just f6 by black is, is probably good enough, and you're actually in, in your own pawn's way. It's going to be tough to uh, get this guy promoted. And uh, what were the other moves? Um, King f4 seems highly illegal. Knight f4 also seems highly illegal. OK, no, knight f4 seems good. But um, yeah, rook e8 check uh, is another interesting idea. 
but the Black King is actually just going to step closer to the pawn. Now, Rook c8 is what I played in the game, but here it turns out King d7 is good enough for Black for the moment. Turns out the winning idea is pushing the pawn forward. Who would have guessed that your passive pawns must be pushed? Uh, this is the only move uh, that actually wins the game here. And what's the point? Well, the point is after King c8 or King f6. Now you go Rook c8, and this pawn is indefensible. You go knight e7, then h7, and you can win the game. Um, so why is rook c8 uh, worse? Well, after rook c8, we don't have to go knight e7. We can actually go king, king d7 to defend this pawn. And then if we try the same thing, knight f6 is in time to catch the pawn. Uh, so rook c8, king d7 played in the game, and I actually stepped back with rook h8, and my opponent played king e7, and then I played h6. Uh, and after king f6, we transposed back to the main line uh, of the actual tactic. So a little bit of back and forth there. But after king f6, we're back to this line, h7, and queens. And now white is simply up a piece. So let's sort of take stock of, of what we have in mind here. So, so far, let's jump back to the initial tactic that my opponent missed after a3. Here, my opponent has a tactic. And it's important to understand that these tactics don't come out of nowhere. My opponent has a tactic because I made a lot of loose pieces. right? All of these pieces are somewhat involved in the actual tactic, and they're all sort of under-defended. So does this mean you should never make a loose piece ever in your game? No. This means that if you do make a loose piece, uh, or if your opponent makes a loose piece, that's when you need to start thinking about these tactics. Start making sure that nothing bad is going to happen to you, or try to make sure that you can make something bad happen to your opponent. So again, knight c2, the idea here, with knight takes d4, and bishop takes f4, just being unstoppable. Uh, and then later on, we have this idea of the advanced pawn being used in tactics as well. So we're building up these sort of uh, warning signs, loose pieces, common tactical motifs, uh, and now the advanced pawn is also really important. Now, I want to introduce yet another idea that is going to lead to tactics, and that is the idea of the weak king. And for this one, I'm going to turn to players a little bit better than me to show off just how complex tactics can be, but how they are sort of made up of all these same building blocks that we're just talking about. And for these players, I am turning to one Grandmaster Wesley So, against one Grandmaster, Ali Reza Ferruja. Of course, they just played in the Magnus Carlsen Invitational. And this is probably uh, the wildest game in the tournament, definitely the wildest one that I've seen so far. Um, it was a lot of fun. So let's take a look here. Uh, we have Wesley with the white pieces, starting off with a Karel Khan. Get bishop f5, knight f3, e6, bishop b2. This is actually the short variation. I myself like going c5 here. Uh, Ali Reza chooses the slightly so slower move of knight e7, preparing this break a little bit more. And actually, he goes for some expansion on the king side with h6, g5. In the meanwhile, Wesley So pushes an a pawn because that's what alpha 0 does, and alpha 0 is very smart. Um, <laughs> a6 by black, b4 now by Wesley, and Wesley just gains a ton of space over here on the queen side. And now this is likely the downside to taking your time with playing the move c5 you might not ever get the chance if you're playing Wesley So. Uh, so instead, Ferruja starts pushing on the king side with f6. Now, this stuff isn't really that tactical uh, kind of play that I wanted to talk about here. Uh, Wesley pushes f7 just to get rid of the king's castling rights. And after we finish development here, knight bd2, bishop d6, knight b3. Um, I want to pause here for just a moment and, and just take stock of the position. So, uh, if you were to look at the loose and vulnerable pieces here, you might think that this bishop on d6 is a bit loose because it is undefended for the moment. And while that is true, it's also a very difficult piece to attack, right? There's really only one legal way to do it, and that would lose a bishop for white. So not super dangerous for black to have this bishop here. And for white, I am going to claim there is actually a sort of vulnerable piece uh, in the form of the knight on f3. It's defended well enough, but it is a bit vulnerable to a pawn push, which could uh, start unleashing some tactics for black. Now, in the game, black actually plays the move queen c7. And keeping in mind 
our idea of tactics. Now, the pawn on h2 is a little bit loose, and of course, black has made the threat of g4. Now, this might seem sort of obvious to people, but it's important to understand that uh, these components of like loose pieces still exist in these positions. Ferruja is making this threat uh, to play a tactic with g4. So he's noticing that this knight is vulnerable and now trying to take advantage of it while at the same time making a useful developing move. That's how these tactics are getting used at a high level. Wesley, of course, spots the threat and plays the move g3. Uh, but importantly, black has sort of developed the queen for free, and that's how you can start to make use of vulnerable pieces, even if you don't directly have a winning tactic. Uh, we get knight f6 by Ferruja, bringing the knight into the potential attack. Bishop d3 by Wesley is offering a trade. And now we do just get g4 gaining space for Ferruja. And the knight steps back to e1, and now h5. We get rook a2, and now h4. And uh, at this point, I think this is a good, uh, good time to sort of stop and say, uh, let's reevaluate the loose pieces and see if this is a position where black may have, black or white may, may have a tactic. So with h4, has black made a threat, chat room? What do you think? Did h4 make a threat here? What's up, Manny? Thanks for coming out. And yeah, Exquisite Corpse in the chat says, it's the short variation, wrong variation. I don't know if he means by white or by black, but uh, I tend to agree. Manny has apparently seen the game. I guess this one was pretty famous. It was a pretty famous one. So. Uh, Jaden says, I'm going to trust Ferruja and say yes. And that's not really a bad way to, uh, to go here. So with h4, uh, on the surface level, if, if we're just talking about material, uh, h takes g, f takes g, bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes, it looks as though white is not losing any material. But of course, this is ignoring the huge factor of king safety. So in fact, the king safety is what is really going to be relevant in this game, and in fact is, is what uh, almost decided the game in, in both players' uh, favor. Instead, of course, they ended up drawing. So uh, this is the next building block that I wanted to introduce, uh, the idea of king safety. So we have these loose pieces, these common tactical motifs, and now king safety is going to be really, really important. Because of course, you know, having a weak king is kind of like just having a loose piece. If the king, except if the king dies, you know, the, there's no uh, coming back from that, no counter tactics. So in the game, Wesley plays the move knight c5, which is correct. Now, why is the move knight c5 correct? Honestly, it's, it's a little bit above my head. I think the point is that if you do go in for this variation now, queen g3, rook g2, queen h4. Um, the point now is that, uh, well, number one, uh, white is going to be able to make some counter threats using, using this knight on c5. And number two, let's just see what happens, for example, if I were to play a bad move like rook e2. Why does this make a difference? Hold on. I didn't get into all these variations when I started here. OK, there's knight takes f4 here. All right, just trust me. Knight c5 is correct. And we're not worried about the details of the tactics this time. We're worried about the tactical ideas behind them. And so now uh, black plays the move rook h5. So let's try and see if we can find the move that Wesley so missed now, OK? Ignoring these random sacrifices that nobody has time to calculate, uh, let's see if we can find the move that Wesley so missed in the game using these sorts of tactical building blocks that we're talking about. Uh, first of all, why might there be a tactic here in the position? Well, because this piece is looking a little bit loose here on h5. It's only defended by the knight. This piece on g4, and uh, sorry, not on g4, this piece on f5 and h5 is perhaps vulnerable to a potential fork on g4. And of course, the king on f7 is not the safest it's ever been. And because of all this, there is, in fact, a winning tactic here for Wesley So, So see if you guys can find it. Mm. 
Bishop takes bishop on f5. I'm not sure I agree. So yeah, shove actually has the right idea, the highly counterintuitive move f3. You know, your opponent is attacking the g3 pawn a billion times. So what do you do? Well, of course, you undefend it. That's just the way it goes. And the point now is that if your opponent does capture on g3, we actually do have our super common tactic of forking bishop and rook, taking advantage of the king weakness, a common tactical motif of a pin, and uh, as well as just launching an attack against the black king. After something like g2, you're going to get some complicated stuff here involving the king coming out to f2. But at the end of the day, this fork is going to be nasty. And if you want to take here, you can take on h5 and uh, have a winning intermezzo with h takes g6. So f3 would have been a really nice find for uh, Wesley, but understandably, he, he missed this one. And the point I'm really trying to get at here is that uh, your tactical play will, will really be at a much higher level if you know when to think about tactics. In this position, and it, it kind of seems obvious that you should be thinking about tactics, but knowing where to look is also going to be very helpful. Noticing the rook opposite the king, these common pinning ideas, noticing these pieces sort of ripe to be forked, that's how you can start arriving at moves like f3 in your own games, even though Wesley missed it here and played rook e2. So, rook e2, and now Ferruja decides it's go time, takes on g3, takes on g3, takes on g3, and gets queen to h3. Now, Wesley so starts playing a series of very interesting moves that uh, lose the game, but uh, do make it quite interesting. So, with this knight on c5, Wesley's big idea is to sacrifice on e6. Now, why sacrifice on e6 here? I think the idea is to soften up both the f file uh, along with this d3 g6 diagonal, uh, attacking this knight here on g6. So we have bishop takes e6 in the game, and now knight f3 was Wesley's idea. The point being, uh, the threats on this diagonal are actually going to be useful, and this knight is going to come in to, to help attack as well. But, of course, black to move does Ferruja have a tactic, a counter tactic? <clears throat> Exquisite Corpse has a tactical saying, CCT plow. Checks, captures, threats, pawn moves, looser, overworked pieces. That's a lot, that's quite the acronym. Quite the acronym there. So, yeah, this is the question, Exquisite Corpse. It's less about what you do when you're calculating and when you're calculating. You want to find out when the position is ripe for tactics. This one, it's a bit more obvious that it's ripe for tactics because, you know, that everything's just so crazy. In this case, most of the tactics revolve around this king's weakness. And yeah, everybody seems to know already that um, queen takes g2 is the idea here. Uh, I don't know if I could have come up with this one on my own, but queen takes g2 does win the game. And the point now is that after g takes on f3, there's simply no good way to recapture this guy. If you play rook takes, you can get hit with knight takes, or knight h4 check, and knight takes on f3. And something like rook h3 here, there's just really nothing good you can do with all of these ideas coming into the position. Um, of course, queen takes f3 immediately, would lose to knight h4 check, winning uh, the queen. And king takes f3, loses to this common tactical motif of the skewer. So Ferruja could have combined all of these tactical ideas, uh, forks, pins, skewers, and uh, a weak king. To, to win the game here with something like this. By the way, if you just play something like king f2, uh, black might not have a queen here, but black does have plenty of opportunity to continue attacking this king. Uh, and that's sort of the way the game would have gone, something like rook f8, and black is just continuing with, with a winning attack. <clears throat> okay, but queen takes g2 was missed in the game. By the way, queen h1 followed by queen g2 is the same. Instead, Ferruja plays the move knight h4, which does look like a pretty good move, right? You just bring another piece into the attack, but now Wesley simply trades this piece off, goes bishop f4, 
guarding the h2 square a little bit, and also giving the king uh, a, a slightly better flight path than he had before. We get rook h8 by Ferruja, queen e2. And now everybody agrees that the game is a draw. Um, after g3, Wesley does have to take this pawn to give the king this flight path once again. Now we get queen h3, and believe it or not, there may be a tactic here for Wesley once again. So, white to move. Why is there a tactic? Magician of Riga. I don't remember which chess player was called the Magician of Riga, to be honest with you. All right, my producer Ben Simon says it was tall. I don't, maybe, could be. I believe it. Yeah. It was Tal. Ben Simon knows more about chess history than I do. It's tough. I'm just glad I didn't look stupid. <laughs> yeah, in the times I think we're, we're pretty accurate. I think this is about how much time they had. But okay, what is the tactic? Of course, not rook takes f6, no reason to sacrifice the rook, just bishop e5. And this is just the start of a, a winning attack now for white. Of course, this can be defended, but um, actually, Fruge defended it the other way, which also works. But now, after rook takes f6 check, rook takes f6, bishop takes f6, we get a queen check by black. And now, of course, king takes here would simply get checkmated to something like this. Uh, so king takes bishop, not going to be playable. Instead, Ferruja goes all in with rook h2. Um, but white does actually have a way to win the game here with the amazing move, bishop g6 check. Uh, the king cannot really capture here because then this is a fork. Uh, so king f8 would be forced and simply queen f3 now or, or really any move. And uh, Ferruja is not going to get away with it. Uh, instead, Wesley unfortunately misses this bishop g6 idea and they trade pieces and agree to a draw. So, quite the game here between Ferruja and Wesley. So, uh, in a highly tactical game, and the point I want to get across from this one is just highlighting how important the king's safety can be. In a relatively normal position, way, way, way back, it looked kind of relatively normal, uh, I would argue that this one might look abnormal to, to most people still, but it's nothing really too crazy. You have this weird looking king on f7, but you know both sides have sort of their space on each side of the board. It's not as if there's a ton of tactics in the position. So how does Ferruja go about creating tactics? Well, he does so by attacking the king. One of the most common ways to end up with a super tactical game is like this. So when do you start calculating tactics? Well, you start calculating the tactics when you can start making tangible threats. And those happen against the loose pieces, those, happens, those happen with common tactical motifs. Those happen with a weak king. They happen with an advanced pawn. You just sort of start building all these things together to develop an intuition for when you need to calculate. All right, questions on this game. I know we didn't delve too deeply into all of the variations there. This is more of a broader, broader picture type of class tonight. But questions on this one before we keep moving on. Keep moving on. Yes, or as Exquisite Corpse says, just use this very simple acronym with seven letters. OK, let's move along then. I want to step back to uh, sort of the realm that I understand, which is my own 10-minute rapid games. Because again, I do think these rapid games are a great way to train sort of tactical intuition. Um, because you know, in a real over-the-board game, you do have enough time to calculate a lot more. Uh, but it's really, really helpful if you can sort of fall back on that intuition to give you these alarm bells when you should be thinking of tactics. And in 10-minute games, when you can't really calculate everything, you sort of have to rely on that intuition a little bit more. OK, my opponent was a 2300 by the name of Spiros, and I had the black pieces. We get a Karo Khan, just like Ferruja, except my opponent plays the fantasy variation instead. Uh, D takes e4 is the main line. We get e5, knight f3. Bishop g4, bishop c4, all very normal stuff so far, knight d7. Uh, by the way, even though this is just the opening, uh, and I do just know all the theory here, I think my opponent and I both did, 
this is already a position where you should be thinking about tactics. And you should really be thinking about tactics if you don't know the theory here. So who can spot some common tactical motifs already in this position? Are threats being made yet? So yeah, of course, of course, of course there are tactics in the position. This pawn is uh, attacked and not even defended. This bishop is undefended out here on g4. And my king is a little bit weak, right? And so of course, white is actually making a threat here of bishop f7 and knight e5 when uh, white would just be winning the game. So I, I did sort of just already know that this tactic existed here because it's only move six. But notably, even in the opening, these things can appear when you start making loose pieces. So that's why knight d7 was played. Now if knight e5 is tried, I can play knight takes e5 and defend the bishop. So instead, we get castles, knight gf6. And the same problem exists now with the knight defending e5. So h3 was played. I went ahead and captured on f3 and played bishop d6. So uh, after the move c3, uh, I'll go one more move ahead. I castled. White plays bishop g5. Should I be thinking about tactics here? And if so, what tactics should I be thinking about? What tactics? What tactical ideas are in the position? What pieces should I be looking at? Fork on e5. Yeah, this is an important one. This is an important one. Got to look out for a potential fork on e5. And uh, this is a little bit more of a positional concept, but that's why we're sort of building up this strong point on e5 for black, to try and prevent something like that happening. So yeah, there's a common pin in the position. And that pin is on this diagonal. We can pin the pawn to the king and actually take advantage of simply two loose pieces. This is what happens when there are loose pieces. This is where tactics sort of come from. And so it's never a bad idea uh, to just sort of stop and, and start thinking, what pieces are loose in the position? And can I just like attack two of them at the same time? The simplest kinds of tactics are sometimes most often, most often missed because you just don't stop to think about them, right? And that's what happens in this position. I actually just sort of play h6 without thinking. Um, or, or I just as well could have played something like queen c7 without thinking, just trying to develop. But in reality, there, there's just a very simple tactic here. right? If you give this to somebody as a tactics puzzle, they're going to say queen b6, attacking two things at the same time. But if you, give this, uh, if you don't give it to them as a tactics puzzle, if they just are playing a chess game, more often than not, I would say, uh, well, maybe not more often than not, but very commonly, it's just going to be missed because players aren't thinking about tactics yet. They're just trying to finish development. And that's the idea I'm trying to hammer home. You should only think, well, you should think about tactics whenever you are spotting loose pieces in the position. Both of these bishops are also loose here. Now, uh, that didn't actually contribute to any concrete tactics here, but it just as well could have, and it's important to, to notice. So h6 in the game. And my opponent backs up, still could go queen b6 here and start taking free stuff. Instead, I played queen c7. My opponent played knight d2. I just expanded out with b5, bishop b3, and c5. Uh, and now my opponent plays queen g3. And this time around, uh, my intuition was strong enough to, to spot the tactic here. So of course, common tactical motif is the discovered attack. And this one is simple enough for me to find. Uh, and so after this, the game actually ended pretty, pretty quickly here. My opponent played queen f2, and I think we might be able to spot another common tactical motif after queen f2. Uh, what do you think, chat room? What do you think here? Any tactical ideas? G5, oh my god. I didn't see g5, to be honest with you. I guess this bishop's trapped. Something a bit better, a bit safer than g5. Pin queen to king, that's exactly right. So my opponent has placed the king and the queen in an awkward position 
susceptible to a common tactical motif of a pin. And so noticing this, just noticing awkward arrangements of pieces, allows us to start finding tactics like uh, I think I played c4 first, I can also play d takes c3, bishop d1, and d takes c3. Just gaining tempo and now making another threat. In the game, my opponent actually just recaptured, I played bishop c5, and my opponent resigned. So that's how you end up with an 18 move game. Now obviously my opponent helped me out a lot here by blundering some pretty simple tactics, but even before that, uh, just simple stuff like queen b6, if you start Paying attention to loose pieces in your games, it's going to be a lot easier to spot the simple stuff. Just look for the loose pieces, look for common tactical motifs, and don't... I'm not saying you have to treat every position as if it, was a, as if it were a tactics puzzle. I'm just saying if you keep an eye on these things, the tactics sort of start to make a little bit more sense. They don't come out of nowhere. They come from the loose pieces. All right, we've got a few minutes left. I want to do just one more with you guys, and this one is actually going to be more of a calculation test, I guess. Uh, I'm tired of showing all these games that I won. It's time to show you one where I got crushed. Um, so let's do that with m someone named Erfang Han. I can't, I can't. I don't know why I try with Lee Chess names. I can't even pronounce real names, much less Lee Chess names. So it's going to be another Karakhan, and actually another Karakhan fantasy variation. We get knight f3, bishop g4. This time my opponent tries taking on e5. And we get this sort of simplified position here. h3, take, take, knight e5, regaining the pawn. Um, f4, knight g6. And uh, so far, so good, right? Uh, nothing too crazy in the opening. The d file got opened, the, the queens got traded. We get king e2, uh, knight f6, and now king to f3. So, are there any tactical ideas lurking in this position chat? Any tactical ideas that I should be aware of here? Exquisite Corpse says, the lesson is that everyone hangs things in online rapid. And yeah, that's, that's part of what I'm trying to get at here. Like, I don't mean to brag, but I think most of the viewers aren't rated stuff like you know 2470 or even 2300 like the previous opponent and it's important to realize that it's not some crazy high level uh, of chess we're playing here we're still missing tactics all the time and doing these simple things these simple checks where you're just like wait is there a tactic here like is is my opponent making a ton of loose pieces those simple things simple changes to your thought process can be really really helpful in gaining kind of a lot of rating Potential fork on f2 or h4. I don't, like, I guess this is the fork? I don't know what we're talking about here. Knight takes c2 is an idea, if we can get there. So, of course, with queens off the board, uh, you all should be playing for checkmate. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you playing for checkmate here? This king is weak. White is underdeveloped, and I have two attackers against zero defenders uh, in front of this king. Of course, also, this pawn on e4 is a little bit loose, and that is going to be helpful to our cause as well. So, with that hint here, we're playing for checkmate with black, believe it or not, and combining the idea of checkmate with the idea that this pawn is a little bit weak if, uh, if white isn't careful. And yeah, Sebastian has the right idea. So it all starts with knight h4 check here. And the point is that if the king runs this way, it's going to get checked again. And even checked again if it tries to defend this pawn. And eventually, you got to give this one up. And black is much, much better. Uh, and if you try coming the other way, uh, so defending the pawn via tactical means, you're actually going to get checkmated here. You're going to get checkmated, buddy. Of course, black to move in this position, everybody sees the idea. Who knows the idea here? So not quite h5, because that would allow our opponent to play something like f5, get this bishop in the game to help defend. But of course, our idea is going to be f5 ourselves keeping our opponent's pieces locked out of the game. 
Uh, the only try for white is to go uh, rook g1. We still just give check. And now h6, and you're, you're going to get checkmated quite simply. I guess it's technically not checkmate if you run this way. But of course, black is winning here. Um, up in exchange, up quite a few pawns. And this king is not super happy on the g6 square. So surprisingly, in this position after king f3, uh, black already has a winning tactic. And that tactic is to, to go after the weak king and go after the loose pieces in the position. That's where all these tactics are coming from. Uh, now, I actually missed this in the game because I'm not a super genius, and I also didn't think I had any chance of checkmating the white king with queens off the board, so I just played bishop e7. And from here, I started playing some very bad moves and ended up losing the game. So h5 by my opponent is not necessarily a tactic, but it's setting white up to be able to, to have tactics in the very near future. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, this knight has no good squares to go to, so it has to go to e7. And already, you just sort of start feeling a little bit nervous, right? This knight looks very loose on e7. It is defended by the bishop for the moment, but the bishop is also sort of floating out here. The bishop is loose. There's common uh, pinning ideas on the diagonal. And in fact, that is sort of what happens in this game. I play bishop takes c3, which is a very bad move. I make more loose pieces. And then it all sort of starts falling apart here with uh, my opponent's two bishops being a bit too a bit too powerful here with these pawns coming down the board. And we, we don't need to look at the rest of this game. I, I tried some sort of clever checking on the way out, but my knights ended up just getting, getting a bit trapped, and I lost this game pretty convincingly. But I didn't have to. There was this big tactic in the opening. Um, okay, so let's wrap it up here. I'm going to take questions from the chat on this game or any of the games overall that we talked about. And then I just sort of want to say you know, my, my final piece on trying to spot tactics in your own games. So questions from the chat first. Um, I don't think there, there's going to be too many. This one was a bit more of a straightforward tactic than anything else. So let's wrap it up here. So what did we learn tonight? Well, uh, the, the preface is that you know, players are very good at solving tactics in tactics puzzles. They're a lot less good at finding tactics in their games. They don't know when you should be looking for a tactic. And that is how most tactics end up getting missed. If you stop and say, hey, look, there's a tactic here, more often than not, people can, can actually find it. Uh, so what do you look for? Well, you look for loose pieces. You look for common tactical motifs, things like the advanced pawn, things like a, a weak king, a king that can be attacked. And if all of these elements are sort of fumbling around in the position, that's when you really need to stop and say, hey, wait a second, there might be a tactic here. And with that simple sort of thought process that sets off these alarm bells for you, you'll get a lot better at spotting tactics in your games. Just take it from Wesley So and Ferruja. Um, anyways, that's going to do it for us here tonight on The Road to 2000. As always, I want to thank you guys very much for watching. Uh, tune in later tonight on the Twitch channel. It looks like Harrison is going to be doing another late night show. Twitch.tv slash St. Louis Chess Club. Um, and do tune into that. Please tune in next week for another Road to 2000. And as always, I will see you next time.